The World Beyond the Headlines lecture series is a project of the University of Chicago Center for International Studies. Tonight we welcome Professor Joubert Ashkar to discuss his latest book, The Arabs and the Holocaust, The Arab-Israeli War of Narratives. Introducing tonight's speaker is Orit Bashkin, assistant professor in the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations. Orit is a historian specializing in the modern Middle East, and her research interests include Arab intellectual history, modern Iraqi history, and the history of Arab Jews in Iraq and Israel. Her book, The Other Iraq, Pluralism and Culture in Hashemite Iraq, is now out in paperback. Following Professor Oshkar's remarks, she will be joining him for a one-on-one -on -one conversation, and then we will open up the discussion to the audience for Q&A. Please join me in welcoming Professor Bashkin. Thank you very much for coming uh, tonight. Uh, it gives me a great pleasure to introduce to you today uh, Professor Gilbert Ashkar. Um, Professor Ashkar uh, grew up in Beirut, and he taught in France and in England. He's currently the Professor of Development Studies and International Relations at the School of um, Oriental and African Studies uh, in London. Among his many books and publications are The Clash of Barbarisms, The Making of a New World Disorder, which was translated into um, 13 languages, Perilous Power, The Middle East and U.S. Foreign Policy, co-authored with Noam Chomsky, The Israeli Dilemma, a debate between two left-wing uh, Jews, and the list is actually much longer. The reason uh, Professor Ashkar has been invited to speak to us today is, uh, in, uh, is his outstanding and path-breaking uh, book, The Arabs and the Holocaust. In recent years, the field of Middle Eastern studies witnessed an important change. In the past, a great deal of scholarly attention has been devoted to Arab military and intellectual elites who supported Nazi and fascist regimes. These pro-fascist elites saw the fa fascist and Nazi modernizations of effort as acceptable and even worth uh, emulating, and felt that a strategic alliance with Germany, Italy, and Japan might help challenge the dominance of French and British colonialism. Nonetheless, in recent years, scholars like Israel Gershani, James Jankowski, Goetz Nordbruch, and Peter Wien, among others, have illustrated that fascist and Nazi uh, models did not enjoy wide support as large segments within Ar the Arab intelligentsia challenged their peers uh, who espoused fascist views. Professor Ashker's book stands out as the book that represents this paradigmatic shift and as a work at the forefront of a new thinking about the Holocaust as it was understood and it is being understood in the Middle East by various actors. Professor Ashkar's book enables us to hear voices that objected to fascism and Nazism by uh, be they liberal educated, liberals educated in France, uh, nationalists troubled by the potential threat of uh, German Nazi colonia uh, colonialism, particularly after the occupation of Ethiopia, social democrats, communists, religious intellectuals. He shows us um, that the pro-Nazi and pro-fascist camp, albeit significant, was met with uh, meaningful resistance. Professor Ashkar doesn't neglect the, milita the militarist and nationalist groups that, took, uh, that look into cooperation with Germany. However, by introducing the ways in which the pro-fascist contingent was criticized by Arab intellectuals and various political actors, Professor, Professor Ashkar not only expands our understanding of the Arab public sphere at the time, but also, and more importantly, provides a much needed context for understanding Arab politics, the Arab politics of the interwar year and the war years. The book, however, doesn't end here. Professor Ashkar then takes us to what he terms as the war of narratives, or how the realities of the Arab-Israeli conflict uh, and the Palestinian Nakba led to the use and abuse of the historical past. The book, in a way, is a rigorous critique of all those who had cheapened the Holocaust, from Holocaust denial in the Muslim world to Israeli politicians who equated Arab leaders such as Gamal Abdel Nasser to Nazis. The book reminds us what happens the book reminds us what happens um, when the past becomes a tool in political games. The book, however, is also a plea for a new horizon. 
Just as it exposed the variety of, vo of Arab voices during the war years, the book courageously chronicles those Palestinian, Arab, and Israeli intellectuals who insisted on the past. The courageous battle of Arab intellectuals, Muslim and Christians alike, against Holocaust denial and against anti-Semitism in the Arab world, and the name of Professor Edward Said comes to mind here, but together with also Israeli historians who insist that the gravest, most horrific tragedy of the Jewish people should be protected from contemporary politics are all exposed in his book. And this is why this book, despite his uh, uncompromising exposure of such phenomena as anti-Semitism, religious and national extremism, and vociferous rhetorics, also gives us limited hope for some future in which Jews and Arabs, Israelis and Palestinians, respect each other's pasts, are attentive to each other's tragedies, and are willing to think differently about the past, the present, and possibly the future. So I, it gives me great pleasure again to introduce to you Professor Gilbert Ashkar. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Bashkin. Thank you all for, for coming. I think the uh, four centers that are sponsoring this uh, invitation, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. And it's indeed uh, a pleasure and a honor to, 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 to be here speaking and, uh, in, this, uh, in this hall and discussing this topic with you and uh, with Professor Bashkin. Um, well, <clears throat> this is indeed a, a book about uh, what I call the, the war of, uh, of, of narratives uh, in, uh, in, in the Middle East. And uh, this is uh, here, uh, narratives uh, is a term to be taken here in, uh, in, in, the, in more than the duality of, of, uh, of two narratives, but uh, I would say in the plurality of, of narratives. And th that's one of the uh, key points I make uh, in the book, uh, and, uh, especially with, uh, when uh, it comes to the Arab side, but not only the Arab side, also the, the Israeli side or the Zionist side is the plurality of, of what we are dealing with. And uh, uh, therefore, this is uh, I mean, an argumentation against any essentialization of, uh, of the conflict, the one that translates in formulas like uh, the Arab discourse or the uh, Arab attitude in the singular when we are dealing with uh, such a, a very big uh, population. And even if we're dealing with a very small group, I mean, un unless we're speaking of a monolithic uh, sect or party, then, I mean, to, to, to speak of one single attitude on, uh, on complex political issues is uh, completely mis misleading. But as you understand, this is part of an essentialization of things. And uh, you, you have a lot of uh, essentialization in this conflict. I mean, Edward Said was uh, uh, mentioned, uh, the, the, the whole idea beyond, behind his critique of Orientalism, uh, or what he called Orientalism, was precisely the essentialization of the other, the essentialization of the Orient. And we have a lot of it. Uh, in the Middle East conflict, and again, I mean, we, we can find it, uh, of course, on on uh, on both sides. Uh, and one of my main concerns was to to to, to explain precisely this uh, the, the fact that uh, uh, um, we are dealing with uh, uh, populations among which among which you have a, a wide range of uh, of uh, of attitudes. Um, as I said, it's mainly about the, uh, this variety of attitudes on, on, on the side, on the, the Arab side of, of the, 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 the conflict uh, from uh, uh, the, 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 the 20s and 30s uh, of last century up to, 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 to our time, uh, trying to see how political positions were uh, diversified and uh, how they also w uh, changed or uh, uh, developed uh, throughout history. Um, and this concern with, uh, with the Arab world is, as I said, I mean, not only uh, uh, I mean, uh, limited to the Arab world, but also uh, one of the points I, I make is um, 
that even when dealing with Zionism, and here we are speaking of a political ideology, not of a community or a population like the Arabs, but even when, when one is dealing with Zionism, uh, one should take into consideration that Zionism also is plural, that there are several uh, forms of, uh, and brands of, of Zionism, uh, from the cultural Zionism to status Zionism, and within, within what could be described as more or less uh, um, status Zionism nowadays, I mean, you have also a wide range of, uh, of, uh, of attitudes, and that's why sweeping statements about uh, Zionism in general uh, I mean, are open to, to, to criticism, and they criticize the such, uh, such statements. And so one of, I mean, the other key aspects of that is that um, uh, in this peculiar uh, discussion of the, of the Middle East conflict, uh, there is a lot of, uh, of ethnocentrism. I mean, one could say that ethnocentrism is, uh, is more or less universal, and uh, indeed, uh, uh, I can hardly think of any people who are beyond uh, ethnocentrism, but at least uh, those who make the profession of being, you know, scholars and uh, people having uh, critical-minded people ought to be able to, uh, to, to make the effort necessary to, to overcome uh, ethnocentrism. And when, when, when you look, when you consider, of course, I mean, uh, I've devoted uh, 400 pages to that, but when you consider the, 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 the amount of what has been said and is still being said about this conflict, you, you, I mean, you, you, you see the <clears throat> this, uh, this, uh, the, how much I mean, ethnocentric attitudes are, are pervasive. Uh, and we could give uh, uh, s several uh, several examples. Uh, I mean, uh, can uh, just quote uh, recently. Um, uh, somebody uh, criticized my my book. Uh, I mean, in uh, in an online review uh, from let's say a pro-Zionist point of view, and uh, criticized me for using the term Islamophobia and said that uh, this, uh, this concept is being used uh, for, in order to, to quell uh, uh, those who uh, criticize uh, Islamofascism, to put it in the term of, of this person. I mean, this person was not realizing that there was much more use of anti-Semitism to describe discussions of Zionism. And, but this, this didn't occur to the author, so just uh, the same kind of attitudes are, are, are here. So the, the key point is really to try to uh, overcome this kind of, uh, of ethnocentrism also and uh, to, to, uh, to, uh, to, to be uh, able to <clears throat> look at all that in uh, a critical manner, let's say, and self-critical manner. And from that angle, uh, let me start by saying here that, uh, uh, I, as, as was said, I do not uh, refrain from uh, uh, discussing and criticizing uh, very sharply uh, um, all those attitudes that uh, can be seen on, uh, on the Arab side to which I'm supposed to belong uh, culturally and ethnically, if, if this term makes any sense. Uh, so I, I do not uh, hesitate in, in uh, sharply criticizing uh, every manifestation, every expression of, uh, of anti-Semitism or Holocaust denial, because of course there are such, uh, and there are a lot of such uh, expressions uh, uh, that exist, and they have even been uh, increasing. And <clears throat> uh, more fundamentally, uh, on the Arab side, uh, the, the problems in understanding uh, this, this whole issue is that uh, people tend to, to have an attitude of, uh, of, uh, of denial of the connection between the Holocaust and uh, the, 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 the creation of the State of Israel, and therefore uh, not wanting to understand how uh, there, uh, there is a direct connection and that it's not a matter of accepting any legitimization uh, of the state of Israel uh, by, by, by the Holocaust. I mean, this is not the necessary outcome of acknowledging the fact that there has been uh, an obvious historical connection and that uh, had the Nazis not come to power and of course had the genocide and all that not uh, occurred, uh, 
I mean, if we, if we judge by the figures of uh, negative immigration that you had uh, before, uh, before the Nazis uh, came to power, negative immigration from uh, Jewish immigration from Palestine, the, the Zionist project might uh, never have seen, uh, the, uh, seen the, the, the day. Um, uh, and beyond the, the historical connection, there's also I mean, a reluctance to or uh, incapacity to understand the, the role that the Holocaust plays in the Israeli psyche. Uh, and it's a, a real uh, role. It's not just uh, you know a kind of Machiavellian instru instrumentalization of the Holocaust. You one could say that at the political level there are people who do so. And uh, as Professor Professor Bashkin mentioned, uh, I uh, well I dwell on uh, such Israeli authors who have discussed this instrumentalization of the Holocaust by the political institutions of of their of their uh, country, but. On, on the other hand, uh, at the level of the public, uh, or at least big segments of the public, th this is uh, really uh, something important that psyche and then should be therefore taken into consideration. And of course, the worst kind of attitudes that exist on the Arab side are as, uh, those who move from that into a re reactive exploitation of the Holocaust through attitudes uh, of Holocaust denial and the rest. But we have to understand this whole uh, uh, setting. So I started uh, purposely by, by speaking of the, the shortcomings or the, the, the deficiencies on, on, uh, or worse uh, on, the, on the Arab side. Now, let me uh, uh, speak about the, 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 the anti-Arab narrative in this regard, which, uh, to which, uh, I mean, that my book is actually uh, devoted to uh, uh, examining. And uh, the, the, the key point here is that uh, you, have, uh, you have had, uh, ever since actually the, the Second World War, the end of the Second World War, and uh, in an intensive manner, uh, uh, attempts at Nazifying the, con the, the conflict. You have, at, uh, you know, real efforts at, at the Nazification of the conflict, the Nazification of the enemy, the Nazification of the Arabs, and you've had a whole lot. I mean, a whole literature devoted to Nazify the the Arab side. Uh, as I said, immediately after the Second World War, it revolved around the central figure. Uh, of course, of the main villain of the story, the, the, the Mufti of Palestine, Muhammad Amin al Husseini, uh, whom I do not hesitate to, to, uh, to, to, to call uh, for, with the names he, he deserves. I mean, his, uh, his role is completely uh, abject in, in, in the fact that he collaborated with the Nazis. Uh, he uh, um, conveyed their uh, anti-Semitic propaganda to the Arab and Muslim world, and he did all that from a position of knowledge about, uh, uh, about the genocide, as he himself acknowledged in his, uh, in his memoirs. But his, his role has been blown out of proportion. He has been turned by a whole propaganda literature into the representative of all Arabs and uh, beyond Palestinians, if not nowadays all Muslims, uh, 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 disregarding the fact that uh, everything he did from Berlin had very little actual impact in the Arab world. It didn't translate into anything. All his exhortations remained uh, dead letters. And, and this is completely disregarded. And the fact that this uh, also the same man was marginalized after he, he, he came back to, to the region, and especially after uh, 1948, uh, completely marginalized. So he is turned into the main villain of a, of a narrative uh, depicting the, the Arabs as, and the Palestinians as continuators of Nazism. And this is very convenient, of course, from the point of view of of uh, the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the Zionist movement, the state Zionist movement in its uh, fight after 45 for the establishment of the state and uh, uh, thereafter uh, for the, uh, the, uh, the uh, ruling establishment uh, in, uh, in, in Israel. It is very convenient to Nazify the, the, the other side because this provides 
a justification. Uh, it provided a justification in the propaganda after 45 uh, for the uh, creation uh, the, of the, uh, the, 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 uh, is the state of Israel, the, the Jewish state in Palestine. It was provided justification in the propaganda to, to get the victors of World War II to support this project. Uh, uh, and it, uh, it provided also and still provides a justification for the oppression of the Palestinians starting from the ethnic cleansing that happened in 1948, which the Palestinians and Arabs called the Nakba, uh, up to our day. And we can see how, how the, the, this uh, propaganda discourse uh, functions when you Nazify the enemy. We can see uh, a very clear example of it, uh, for instance, in uh, the shocking uh, interview given by uh, Benny Morris Israeli historian Benny Morris to uh, Haaretz in 2004, where, as you know, uh, probably most of you know, Benny Morris has been uh, instrumental among Israeli historians in uh, establishing, uh, on the Israeli side, uh, uh, working on Israeli archives, the uh, reality of this, the expulsion of Palestinians that happened, that occurred in 1948. And uh, in that interview in Haaretz, he does not refrain from calling it uh, I would say by its name, ethnic cleansing. And then he says, well, uh, this ethnic cleansing was uh, completely justified because the alternative was genocide, but not genocide of the Palestinians, genocide of the Jews by the Palestinians. So it was either ethnic cleansing of the Palestinians or genocide of the Jews uh, by the Palestinians. And, and why so? Well, because the Palestinians are barbarians, should be put in cage, uh, and Islam in general is, uh, is anti-Semitic. And actually, uh, there you, you see the same functioning discourse of this Nazification of the enemy. The enemy is genocidal, and therefore everything we do to the enemy is completely uh, warranted, completely justified. So that's how, how the, the narrative functions, and of course, uh, I mean, the central villain is, uh, uh, I mean, Husseini, but, but uh, the, the, the narrative uh, involves m much uh, more than, uh, uh, I mean, Husseini, many other figures historically before the Second World War, in, in the time uh, when uh, Nazism uh, was in power, and also uh, what, uh, what happens next. And, uh, and <clears throat> Again, this is another example of this ethnocentrism that I mentioned in, in this whole literature. For instance, the whole literature about the so-called new anti-Semitism, meaning by that something that would happen, that it would be rooted uh, among Muslims or Arabs. Uh, uh, you, you, in this whole literature, you have a, a regularly the, the, the same the argument that, uh, well, quoting many people on the Arab side who are comparing uh, Zionism to Nazism or the, 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 what uh, Israel does uh, to the Palestinians to, 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 to Nazi oppression of, uh, of other peoples. And, uh, and th these are quoted to, to say that, well, actually these are anti-Semitic statements, these are banalizations of, of, uh, of the Holocaust and of Nazism, and therefore there are, these are forms of Holocaust denial. And the same people who do, who do that, again, disregard completely that uh, the comparisons, uh, comparing the enemies or the others to, to Nazism is a national sport in Israel. And uh, that uh, throughout the years after 48, uh, regularly, uh, the, the, you have had Nazifications of the enemy and uh, Hitler has resuscitated under various forms. Nasser was uh, compared to Hitler. Uh, Yasser Arafat was compared to Hitler. Uh, etc. And you, you probably are aware of uh, um, when Ronald Reagan <coughs> wrote a letter to, to Menachem Begin uh, in 1982, worrying about the, the civilians, the Lebanese civilians in, in Beirut. The, the answer, the open answer, public answer of, of Menachem Begin in his letter to, to, to Reagan was to say, Mr. President, uh, my army is in the same position that the Allies. Uh, uh, besieging Berlin with uh, Hitler in his bunker. I mean, of course, this is completely grotesque uh, uh, kind of comparison. But just to say that this is this is there. But in that case, uh, the same authors would not say, "Well, this is a banalization of Nazism," which actually it is, uh, and more than than that. 
because it's a reversal of, uh, of the roles, and, um, and, uh, and therefore Holocaust denial or, or, or whatever. It is, it's a sheer instrumentalization of the Holocaust of the kind that has been, as I said, uh, criticized by, by many, many Israeli and non-Israeli authors, uh, this, this way of exploiting the Holocaust politically. So um, this, I mean, uh, my book is, is, is devoted to discussing all that, to, to, the, to, to criticizing this uh, Nazification of the conflict, this essentialization of the conflict, and uh, indeed this uh, uh, Nazification of the country or the essentialization of it is uh, the uh, a way also of 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 uh, preventing any possibility or uh, of uh, preventing the belief in any possibility of peace or of any possibility of dialogue because when the enemy is described as such, then I mean you you can't you, you can't make peace with the Nazis, can you? Yeah, this, this is not possible. So you just have to, to, to continue war until the, 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 the final uh, surrender or whatever. And that's the, the way that uh, this, uh, uh, this kind of, uh, of, of discourse uh, functions. Um, so, uh, I, I mean, I, I, I discuss uh, all that. I discuss this narrative. And also, I, I try to, to give an interpretation, explanation of of the what we have seen in recent years, which is the uh, probably what what uh, uh, brought I mean uh, what yeah brought me to 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 uh, to uh, write this book is uh, well the, the the fact that uh, I could see how much uh, uh, there was uh, an expansion of some some certain types of discourse and on the Arab side. Uh, this expansion of, of expressions of anti-Semitism or Holocaust denial, and th these also sh needed to be addressed. And th th these are these are facts, but uh, uh, they have to be understood as related to uh, two two factors. Uh, one which uh, you you see in this, the propaganda which pinpoints all these expressions and uh, just to say that the Arabs, uh, the Muslims or whatever are anti-Semites or, or Nazi-like uh, anti-Semites. Uh, it is, uh, I mean, there has been an expansion of such discourses because of, uh, of uh, the ideological political shift uh, uh, in the Middle East uh, in the last uh, three decades. Uh, from uh, decade, post-war decades when the dominant discourses were, um, or the dominant ideologies in the mass uh, conscience, let's say, uh, the dominant mass conscience uh, were uh, of a more or less progressive uh, character, more or less left-wing uh, type. Uh, uh, we have had a shift from that through a period when the, the, the PLO after uh, 1967 uh, set the tone of, of the uh, Arab understanding of, of the conflict in, in uh, progressive uh, ways uh, with the role of PLO intellectuals like Edward Said again uh, in that regard. And therefore we had a low ebb of, uh, of the expressions uh, of anti-Semitic or Holocaust denial type. And so we, had had, we have had a shift from, from that into a period dominated by uh, ideologies and currents of uh, an, uh, religious fundamentalist character and religious fundamentalism, whatever, whichever one uh, you, you, you want to consider, uh, are of course very much prone to essentialize uh, political conflicts and, uh, and seeing things through religious eyes and uh, seeing people as defined by the, their religious attitudes and from that to moving into uh, anti-Semitic sounding or anti-Jewish, let's say, if, if you put it more accurately, attitudes, uh, the, the, uh, the transition is, is quickly done. But on the other hand, this, uh, the second, the other factor, which uh, is connected uh, to, to this rise of, of, uh, in the Arab world. And we, again, here the ethnocentrism at its best uh, is disregarded uh, in the literature that I discussed, is the fact that uh, parallel to what I described as an ideological political shift in the Arab world, we have had an ideological political shift in Israel and a drift 
to the, toward the far right in Israel, which started 1977 with the victory of, of Likud, which is the continuator of uh, Herut, and therefore the Irgun, that is the far right of the Zionist movement. And ever since uh, they, they, they came to power in 77, they have been the dominant force with, sorry, with a few exceptions in, the, in between uh, until, uh, until today. Uh, and this uh, shift to the, uh, to the far right is such that today the, the, the founding party uh, of Israel, the, the so-called the, the Labour Party, is number four in the Knesset, and number one and two, the two first groups in the Knesset, Israeli Knesset, are heirs to the Herut, are, are uh, heirs to the Likud legacy, Likud and uh, splinter group led by, by Ariel Sharon of Kadima. And number three is uh, the, the, the group of uh, an openly uh, racist uh, politician uh, who prones, uh, who is uh, just uh, uh, calling for or advocating ethnic cleansing, uh, Lieberman, and who is the foreign minister of the state of Israel. And this is completely disregarded. I mean, people just see the, this uh, expansion of currents uh, of a, uh, fundamentalist character and uh, with reactionary ideologies in the Arab world. And the truth is that these currents in the Arab world are generally rather in the opposition and uh, being re repressed than, 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 uh, than, uh, than in, in, in power. Uh, whereas uh, wh what is happening in Israel is completely disregarded. But the fact is that, that this, the, the, in Israel, this drift to the right is at the helm of the state and it translates into an escalation of the conflict of which the invasion of my country, Lebanon, in 1982 was a qualitative uh, turning point in the escalation of violence in the, and therefore in the escalation of, of, uh, of political uh, tensions and hatred and all that in the region on, uh, on, uh, on both sides. And uh, we have had this escalation again with uh, little and few uh, exceptions, one of them being the, the period between 92 and 95 when Itzhak Rabin was uh, heading the government in Israel and when you had the Oslo agreement and uh, well, a lot of one should now call illusions about uh, about peace but uh, more generally this has been a history of escalation of repression of wars of violence peaking with the 2006 uh, a new war on lebanon which was <clears throat> more violent and cruel than uh, uh, anything seen before and of course the 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 onslaught on gaza in 2008-2009, which uh, was uh, a concentration of, of violence in, in a, a very short time of, again, an unprecedented, unprecedented uh, character on, on such a uh, small uh, territory. So these facts are there. They are the facts that, that are uh, feeding this uh, exacerbation of tensions, exacerbations of, uh, of hatred of all kinds, and therefore, the, uh, the expansion of discourses of the, the, the type that I mentioned, but of course, uh, on the other high, uh, on the on the other on the other side, I mean, you have expressions of anti-Semitism, of course, on the Arab side, but you have a, a very clear rise of anti-Arab racism uh, in Israel, and you have, there are a lot of polls about uh, about that. So this is not uh, uh, any less uh, serious than any kind of anti-Semitism. In a sense, it's even, I should say. Worse in the sense that the racism of the oppressor uh, is always uh, worse than, than that of, of the oppressed. I, uh, that's another point I, I stress. Whatever the attitude you take, uh, when uh, a Palestinian uh, who is confronted by harsh oppression from a state that claims to be Jewish, that claims to speak in the, the, the name of the Jews, uh, gets into anti-Jewish uh, attitudes or expression, this cannot be equated with uh, the uh, anti-Arab racism of, uh, of, uh, of uh, people who are uh, oppressing, uh, or uh, an army or a state who are oppressing uh, these uh, Palestinians in, in the same way that I don't put on the same, I don't equate between uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, anti uh, anti 
uh, uh, black racism of a lynching mob in this country one century ago and the anti-white uh, racism that might develop among the black victims or for that matter uh, between the uh, anti-Semitic, anti-Jewish uh, uh, attitudes of a pogrom, pogrom uh, mob and, uh, and the anti-Gentile uh, racism, reactive racism that might develop uh, among the, 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 the Jewish victims of, of, of this. So we have also here to, 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 to keep uh, for the ethical judgment uh, a view of, uh, of the context. And that's uh, what I plead for without in the, any way trying to justify any form of racism being that of the oppressed uh, included. Uh, I'm not trying to justify, I'm just uh, uh, trying to, 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 to uh, explain the, the context in which uh, attitudes develop, how they form, and how it is necessary to understand all that in order to overcome this and any essentialization of the conflict, in order to, 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 to understand that, uh, um, uh, I mean, uh, such attitudes in, in the region are not rooted uh, in some cultural essence on both sides, I'm speaking here, but are uh, essentially uh, a product, an outcome of the conflict itself. They are closely related to conflict itself, and uh, therefore they can be overcome uh, historically if, if, but it's of course a big if, uh, if uh, a true peace uh, came to, to, to see the day. But in order to, to reach, to get to that peace, uh, what is needed is the ability to, to understand uh, the other's point of view, to, to the ability, uh, uh, as I said, for the Arabs to understand the role of the Holocaust uh, historically and what it represents uh, for, for, uh, for the state of Israel. And of course, the, 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 the ability on the Israeli side to acknowledge the role, uh, the responsibility of Israel in, in the expulsion of the Palestinians in 48 and in their continuing oppression ever since. And it is uh, through this uh, mutual uh, acknowledgement uh, that a real mutual understanding uh, would be possible and therefore uh, anything conducive to a, to a real peace. Thank you very much. Okay, so is this, is this working? Okay, so this is the Oprah moment when uh, we first ask questions and then it's your turn. And the first question I wanted to ask you is, how did you become interested in the topic? Um, and also, if you could talk a little bit about your, uh, the, the work about the book, uh, because it seems to me, A, it, as you said, in, uh, it's a very controversial topic, but also it seems to me very, uh, it's, a, it's a very sort of emotionally, it must be very difficult because of the materials, right? The, the present anti-Semitism, racism, the Nakba. Um, so how did you become interested in the, in the book? And if you could tell us a little bit about the work process. Uh, well, the, the, let's say the trivial aspect of it, the prosaic aspect of it is, is that uh, I was asked uh, to, to write uh, a chapter in a uh, multi-volume uh, collective uh, uh, history of, of the Shoah, which uh, was published in, in Italy. Uh, and so there was one volume devoted to the reception of the Shoah, that is the, the, the Holocaust, the Hebrew term for the catastrophe. And uh, so I was asked to, to write the chapter of, on the reception in the, in the Middle East, in the Arab world. And that was the starting point, actually, because uh, after I uh, started researching, uh, and I saw the, 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 the immensity of, of this uh, literature and this pro the proliferation of this kind of literature. Um, and of course, this kind of dialectics that you had between this kind of literature and this, the rise in expressions of Holocaust denial, not necessarily among Arabs, but a major role in this uh, 
uh, regard displayed by uh, Iranian President Ahmadinejad, for instance. Uh, but I mean, this is part part of the story, and this whole picture, uh, I mean, convinced me of the necessity to to write much more than uh, a chapter. And uh, that's also because of my um, probably my uh, uh, own uh, education in uh, in understanding. Uh, uh, the, well, historically, the importance of the Holocaust, and of course, naturally, the, 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 what the, what the Nakba means, and therefore being able to acknowledge uh, in the right uh, proportions, I would say, uh, both uh, tragedies, uh, even if we, we can't equate them. I'm clear on that. I mean, of course, fortunately, the Nakba was not uh, a genocide, but nevertheless, that was a, uh, an act of uh, ethnic cleansing, and therefore. Uh, it can be also described as a crime uh, against humanity. Uh, and um, my, my deep belief that uh, it is possible also to, to, um, to, to get to common narratives between uh, Arabs and uh, Israelis who are uh, on both sides uh, progressive-minded from my own experience. I have a lot of, of uh, Israeli friends. Uh, friends in Israel with whom uh, I have this connection, and th therefore this this book is uh, was written in that in that spirit. And what was the reception of the book in both sort of the Arab world, uh, in Europe? Uh, did you get any responses in Israel? How how did you? I mean, now you're in a in the process of a tour, but what were the responses? Um, well, um, the. I have been interviewed in Yediot Ahronot, mm. which is the widest circulating paper in Israel, and uh, there were two full pages of interview, uh, and uh, central pages, uh, uh, in, uh, that was in April. And uh, I had been contacted by a journalist who I didn't uh, know beforehand, uh, who said he read the book and he, he, he uh, very much appreciated uh, uh, my uh, critical attitude and all that and wanted to bring that to the Israeli readers and so that's how I ended up having two, two full pages in, in, uh, in Yediot Aronot and then they were uh, uh, translated into English and published in the Jerusalem Report, the widest circulating, circulating uh, English language magazine in Israel. So. Uh, that that was it. Now, uh, beyond that, uh, those with whom I am in contact from Israel uh, re responded uh, very favorably to to the book. There. I mean, my friends in Israel read the book and uh, uh, were very positive about it. Yes. So let's go back to a few of the arguments you back uh, you you make in the room in, a, in the book, and I'm wondering, going back to the war years, if you can tell us uh, a bit more about the role of the left, uh, the Marxist um, that you write about, because it seems to me that really your book exposes all these kind of Marxist and socialist voices that were very sort of strongly anti-fascist and kind of were forgotten in recent historiography uh, following the fall of the USSR. And it really brings out the, the, the activity of the left. So again, what made, because you wrote about uh, the left in other contexts, I was wondering if you can tell the audience something about the, these kind of activities that happen um, when the Holocaust was happening amongst the leftist intelligentsia in the Arab world. Yeah, um, this is again an instance of the, I mean, a, a byproduct of the essentialization of the, 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 the others. In, all, in the literature about the Arab discourse, for instance, or the Arab attitude, uh, some major political currents that exist in the Arab world are completely o obliterated, are completely, they, they just uh, are forgotten and completely disregarded. And one of them is, of course, uh, the, 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 the the, the Marxists, the communists, uh, and uh, well, they they uh, they were in uh, so several Arab countries, uh, important political movement, uh, and actually for, from the country with whom you are uh, more familiar than I am, in Iraq, uh, in particular, where you mm -hmm. have one of the largest uh, Jewish communities uh, in the Arab world, uh, the the communist movement had. Uh, many uh, Jewish members um, mm. as, as almost a kind of uh, uh, pattern everywhere with minorities, I should say, not only uh, 
Jewish minorities, and uh, and it was a truly Arab Jewish party in that regard. And what we can notice is usually that uh, those uh, Jewish uh, Marxists were the, the the most radical in their anti-Zionism, the most the harshest in their anti-Zionist uh, attitudes, because they felt that Zionism precisely was uh, de destroying the, the this uh, possibility of. Uh, 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 for, for the Jews to continue I mean, this life of coexistence uh, with their, the Muslims in, in Arab lands. And uh, yes, I mean, this, um, uh, this doesn't apply only to, to Marxists. I mean, uh, the, I, in the book, there's at the same time a, an ideological mapping of, of the Arab world, and that's why I, 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 um, uh, I conceive the book as more than the, the uh, title topic, mm -hmm. that is the Arabs and the Holocaust. And actually, it's a contribution to the uh, intellectual and political history of, of the, the Arab world and uh, the ideological mapping, mm -hmm. the history of ideas. And I distinguish between four main uh, ideological families, one of them, uh, which should not be forgotten is the, the, the Marxist the communist who are of, of course anti-Nazis uh, because of, of, for obvious reasons. Uh, you have the, what I call the liberal westernizers, uh, you have the nationalists, and you have the uh, reactionary or fundamentalist uh, pan-Islamist uh, currents, as I call them. Yeah, and and uh, building ba uh, on the the last one, the the pan-Islamic circles, you uh, you present a very interesting um, analysis of a writing of a, of a very important Islamic thinker called Rashid Ridda, and then you sort of uh, move on to talk about other Islamists. Uh, you criticize Hajamin al Husseini, but I'm wondering how, if you can talk about how we can uh, think about your book as a response to this whole discourse about Islamofascism. Because it seems to me that in the media, it's very easy to kind of uh, look at the admiration expressed by some, uh, by, to take Hajamin and then to take the admiration ex, uh, expressed by some Islamists for Nazi Germany in the post-war years, and then uh, to mix it with kind of recent anti-Semitic motifs by uh, present jihadist movement, and you kind of come up with this idea of Islamofascism. And your book sort of shows, no, it's different. Um, we have to think about secular elites, we have to think about religious elites, but I'm wondering how would you kind of think about your book as a response to this discourse about Islamofascism? Uh, yeah, I mean, the, 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 the figure that you mentioned, Rashid Roda, who, again, I, I tried to, to show how important he was in elaborating this discourse, because this is uh, usually disregarded. I think this is one of the contributions of the book. Uh, 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 is uh, I mean is an excellent illustration of uh, of the fact that uh, uh, you, I mean any essentialization of, of issues here uh, cannot really work. If if we look at his uh, his trajectory, um, this is a Muslim theologian, so someone who is uh, normally very familiar with the Islamic uh, corpus, the, the Islamic uh, religious corpus and writings and scriptures. And uh, in these uh, scriptures, you have, uh, I mean, elements, uh, anti-Jewish elements, but you have also elements considering the Jews as the Christians are people of the book and, uh, and protective of them. And the term dimmis that is very often uh, quoted uh, or means originally, Ahl uh, al are people who are under the protection, so are protected uh, people. And uh, uh, we can see that the same uh, character, uh, Rashid Rada, uh, at the end of the 19th century had uh, philo-Semitic uh, attitudes. Uh, at the time of the Dreyfus affair in France, he, he, uh, he, he uh, criticized the, 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 the Christians, Western European Christians, for their oppression of, uh, of, of the Jews. Uh, and and yet uh, we, we can see how his own position changed, uh, especially after uh, the beginning of the British uh, mandate in Palestine and the uh, intensification thereafter of the uh, settler colonial uh, 
uh, arrival of, uh, of, of Jewish immigrants uh, in Palestine and therefore uh, led by the, the Zionist movement. And he attempted, he tried to, uh, to, 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 to get in contact with uh, the Zionist leadership and uh, in order to, to, you know, to, to offer uh, some kind of agreement saying, look, if you want to, uh, if you're coming to, to establish yourself, uh, yourself in, the, in the Arab lands, you are most welcome, provided you, you just uh, drop this project of, of creating a state of your own. And through the 20s when, uh, uh, I mean, it became clear that uh, the Zionist movement was absolutely and deadly serious about its, uh, its state project and you had uh, tensions rising in Palestine, we see the same person uh, changing and coming to a point at the late, in the late 20s, and that's before the Nazis rise to power, where he will uh, be the first to uh, import and adapt, uh, I could say translate into Arabic, uh, the, uh, the Western anti-Semitic uh, views. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, adapt them uh, to with some religious uh, discourse, and uh, therefore he will establish this uh, tradition among this political current of, uh, as I said, this essentialization of the conflict, which uh, can uh, converge with uh, uh, with anti-Semitism, which was uh, born and a product of uh, of of, uh, of the West of Europe. Um, Yes, uh, now at the same time, if we look uh, presently at uh, the uh, uh, major uh, Islamic fundamentalist currents, those who are mass based, I'm not speaking, of course, of uh, Al Qaeda and all that. Uh, Al Qaeda is uh, deeply uh, uh, reactionary with a deeply racist discourse, which is not only anti Jewish, it's also anti Christians, I mean, uh, Crusaders, the Jews, mm -hmm. and even anti Shiite. Uh, you can see that Al Qaeda in Iraq uh, killed certain. Uh, much more Shiites than uh, than it ever killed uh, Jews mm. or, or anything anybody else. Um, so this is a deeply reactionary current, but we can't put that uh, or equate that with uh, mass-based organizations, uh, which in a sense are uh, forms of expressions of the national uh, struggle of their peoples, like Hezbollah in. Uh, Lebanon or, or Hamas in Palestine. Now, these movements, because of the ideological roots and all that, had uh, and still have, to a certain extent, uh, some uh, views that can be labeled or described as anti-Semitic, but they are also able, as I tried to show, to overcome that if they are faced with political conditions that are conducive to, 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 to this uh, change in, in, uh, in perspective. So things are not uh, doomed, you know, to be uh, always uh, as in the essentializing description of it. Uh, no, I think that, that, that even there, even with such currents, you can have, provided there are mass base, uh, some degree of pragmatism and political evolution, but this is very much uh, conditioned by the uh, the behavior uh, on the Israeli side. So, um, building on that and kind of moving to the the present, I mean, you do talk about the fact that there is this trend of Holocaust denial and, and anti-Semitism today. Um, and I remember, you know, I once went on a trip to London, and in Edgware Road, you can sort of see all these uh, all these books. But I wasn't too concerned because these other books also talk about, you know, Saudis as being Zionist agents and George Bush being the Antichrist. So it's a part of, you know, a kind of a conspiracy theory literature. But on the other hand, it is seem it, it seems to be pervasive in the sense that, you know. You have the cartoons and the TV series. Um, and even sometimes if you open a totally respectable uh, uh, journal um, you would have that has a legitimate criticism of Israel, you would have you know, a Star of David or somebody with a nose that is a bit too long or a reference to the protocols. Um, and you, um, you, you've, you very boldly kind of chart all the intellectuals that uh, denied uh, this trend and, and fought anti-Semitism in the Arab world. And you talk about Saeed, and you talk about Azmi Bishara, and you talk about a lot of Muslim intellectuals. But I'm wondering how, um, 
effective uh, was their discourse? What kind of strategies they adopt to uh, challenge uh, these uh, racist discourses? And were they effective? I mean, is, is somebody like, you know, um, a, a kind of a leading intellectual, can they speak to the same people who read the, you know, conspiracy theories and, uh, and all this kind of literature that um, appears nowadays um, uh, in kind of the street or online? Um, so what are the connections between these intellectuals and their very courageous campaigns and sort of, I don't want to talk about this amorphous street, but about the more popular media and more popular representations? Yes. Um, well, I think uh, uh, the, the, the one has to make a distinction between various types of attitudes, even if you take, for instance, a phenomenon like uh, Holocaust denial. There are degrees and, and forms of Holocaust denials that you can find in, in the Arab world. I would say, for instance, uh, uh, Holocaust denial of the thoughtful uh, way, the, 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 the one that, uh, the, the kind of Holocaust denial that you have in the United States, for instance, uh, with the arguments and all that about, is extremely marginal, I mean, hardly to be found uh, in the Arab world, because people, I mean, are not really interested in that. So the, the, the kind of Holocaust denial attitudes you have are on the one hand, uh, those who are just stemming from an attempt at uh, explaining, of course, it falls into conspiracy theory, but explaining the, uh, the, the clout that, uh, that is perceived as a clout of Israel in, uh, on Western countries and uh, why uh, are Western countries uh, supporting uh, Israel uh, uh, unconditionally as, as they perceive that and therefore they come to the, the view that, well, if they do that, it's because, and of course, this is, even that is a very uh, poor explanation, but it's because Western governments have a guilt complex that is uh, nurtured by Israel around the issue of the Holocaust, and therefore the Holocaust mm -hmm. must somewhere be something created or invented or exaggerated, uh, whatever, by, by Israel. So you have, you have such, uh, such views, of course, uh, very simplistic. And beyond that, uh, you, you have, and this is a major uh, segment of, of such of expressions of Holocaust denials, which anyhow are not, I'm not speaking that, uh, and we shouldn't get the, the view that the Arab world is overwhelmingly uh, uh, denying the Holocaust. That's uh, not, not the case. But I'm speaking of this expansion, uh, the expansion, uh, relative expansion of uh, this Holocaust denial in recent years. And a lot of it is actually a purely uh, uh, reactive kind of attitudes, uh, as uh, was very clearly established for the uh, um, uh, one of the cases where we have uh, quantitative uh, assessment, uh, it's the studies done by the Jewish Arab Center of the University of Haifa. Uh, and uh, in 2006, they found that it was a surprise, in a sense, uh, to find that among uh, Palestinian Israelis, I mean, uh, uh, Palestinians ho holders of Israeli citizenship uh, the, 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 to a question of a Holocaust denying uh, character in the poll, you had 28% of Holocaust denying therefore answers. And that was deemed absolutely uh, huge for uh, this population which uh, knows about the Holocaust because it's taught about the Holocaust because they also, uh, well, they live in Israel, they, they speak Hebrew, most of them, and, uh, and yet you had that. And uh, the, 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 the center uh, assessed very correctly that this is not an attitude based on uh, factual uh, information whatsoever. It is a form of protest of a population which in the few years up to the poll in 2006 had uh, uh, been confronted with uh, a very sharp uh, conscious of their status as second class citizen after 12 of them were killed in 2000 uh, in impunity by, by Israeli forces uh, the, uh, and uh, seeing at the same time the escalation of violence uh, on, on the on the, in the West Bank and Gaza and being confronted to, to all this experience. And therefore, indeed, uh, you, you had such forms of, of protest which uh, 
I, I describe as an anti-Zionism of fools, because that's what they are. That's people who, who believe that in doing so they are uh, you know, combating or fighting or, or uh, finding an outlet, I should say, for their frustration, because that's more uh, the, the accurate as a description, uh, being important to, to retaliate in kind to, to what they suffer on the end of Israel, they uh, f treat the Holocaust as, you know, a kind of, of target, uh, symbolic way of, uh, of, of erasing. But of course, this is uh, actually damaging to their own cause because uh, it just comforts the, uh, the, the the kind of propaganda discourse that you have on the on the other side. Yeah. Okay. Um, I had uh, other questions, but I guess uh, the audience deserves uh, uh, the chance to ask questions. So Alex will moderate. I, I didn't agree with you. Let me put it frankly. I don't think that the problem between the Israelis and the Arabs is Nazism and uh, Holocaust denial. I agree with you. I don't think Arabs, uh, other than the president of Iran, deny the Holocaust. I think the problem is territory, isn't it? In 1948, when the state of Israel was established, the Arab countries immediately attacked. It wasn't that the Jews suddenly got rid of everyone from Israel. They attacked, and ever since then, they've been trying to destroy the state of Israel. And that's where the conflict is. And it was even before then. It's territory, not uh, anti-Semitism, not anti-Arabism, not uh, Holocaust denial or Nazism. Thank you. Was there a question that you had? Do you have, want a response from the speakers, or, or would we like another question? Let's. Okay. Okay. About how you feel about the statement. Yes, sure. Okay. Uh, yes, sure. Please. Um, well, if you say it's about territory, um, you have to also understand the, uh, the, 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 the whole context of things. Uh, here you have. Um, uh, immigration, which built up over uh, a few decades with the project of establishing a state in that country which was already populated, which was not uh, a land without a people, uh, yes, as the pro some propaganda discourse wanted it to be. And, and in 1947, uh, you have the, uh, you, you had uh, <coughs> the United Nations uh, trying to, to um, uh, propose something about that. Uh, the Arab side of this conflict, the League of Arab States, uh, uh, put forward a blueprint for a binational state, what amounts a binational state with proportional representation of, uh, of the Jews who lived in Palestine, where one, one third of the population. And ultimately what you had is a resolution giving this one third of the population the majority of whom were immigrants arrived over the uh, years, 20 years uh, before, uh, giving them 56% uh, of the country. Well, I, I don't know of any people on earth who would have reacted by saying, uh, that's very nice, we, 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 we agree with that. This, this didn't happen. And, uh, and actually, uh, ever since that was uh, announced, you had uh, the beginning of, uh, of, uh, of uh, fightings, uh, the, the, the acts of ethnic cleansing, and, and uh, the, 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 which intensified with the, uh, the Arab-Israeli, uh, the first Arab-Israeli war. So uh, yes, it is about territory. Yes, it is uh, related. Uh, to that, but it is from the Arab point of view, from the Palestinian point of view, it's about a colonial project, a settler colonial project, which led to the creation of a state of a colonial character. That's how it is seen in the Arab world, and 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 uh, at the expense of the native population, which ended up being 80% uh, of it uh, expelled from from its land. So that's how people think. This is, again, you have uh, narratives. I'm, I'm sorry, if you have a question, could you, could you join the queue? Thank you. Go ahead, please. Good evening. Um, I think it ought to be pointed out that Iranian President Ahmadinejad did not deny the Holocaust. 
He disputes the figures of the Holocaust. I think those are two different animals. Um, in the context of Bi uh, Bishop Desmond Tutu's observation that apartheid Israel is even more uh, apartheid than was South African apartheid, I was wondering if I might could fully understand something that you said. If I didn't mishear you, you said that each side of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict should make an effort to understand the other. Given the repression and violence that are overwhelmingly delivered by Israel upon the Palestinians, wouldn't it be more just for the responsibility to be on Israel to understand the Palestinians? Yes, um, uh, well, first of all, about uh, Ahmadinejad, uh, uh, he has full of, uh, I mean, a lot of contradictory statements anyhow. But uh, if you mean that disputing the figures of the Holocaust is not Holocaust denial, no, it is. I mean, uh, Holocaust denial, uh, you have a range of attitudes that are classified under this category. And uh, uh, those who just deny the whole uh, reality of the Holocaust are just part of that. Uh, those who uh, deny the intentionality of, uh, of, of, of the genocide uh, are part of that, and those who belittle or try to, to uh, uh, you know, uh, to uh, explain that uh, only, only between quote marks, uh, one million or even less uh, were killed, uh, are trying to show that that basically the, the common knowledge about the Holocaust is uh, is wrong, and therefore the root of this kind of expression is conspiracy theory, Jewish conspiracy, because if if everybody be, uh, is told that uh, there were five to six million uh, victims of, uh, of the uh, genocide and the reality is one thick or less than that, then how, how, come, how, come, how can you uh, explain this other than through uh, conspiracy theory? And this conspiracy theory is the most classical form of anti-Semitism, the modern anti-Semitism is the, the idea of the Jewish conspiracy and the Jewish power. Um, uh, about the, uh, of course, the, the, the Israeli side, and uh, there it's a state responsibility, and the, the, the key, uh, the key, the key to, to uh, any uh, peace uh, in the Middle East is uh, first and above all uh, the uh, the acknowledgement by the Israeli state. I said it of its uh, responsibility in the Nakba and in the continuing oppression of the Palestinians. I mean, it's not only a matter of history and acknowledging uh, historical fact. It's also about a, a continuing oppression that has to be stopped and, uh, and, uh, and uh, repaired. But uh, um, what I meant is that uh, it is important on, on the, uh, the, my side, my, the Arab side uh, as well, uh, to be uh, able to understand the uh, historical connection that exists between the Holocaust and uh, and uh, the uh, I mean the state uh, the creation of the state of Israel and the role that the Holocaust plays in the Israeli psyche and understand also that uh, attitudes of Holocaust denial uh, I mean on the one hand are comforting the most hawkish attitudes uh, in, on the Israeli side and therefore making the situation of the Palestinians uh, actually worse and are, uh, aside from that, a disservice to the Palestinian cause because, uh, as you know, uh, there is an intensive monitoring of any forms of expression of this kind uh, by uh, pro uh, or uh, by Israeli sources, actually internet uh, resources and the rest. And uh, this gives a presentation of the Arabs as uh, you know, uh, just uh, people uh, uh, full. I mean, made of uh, Holocaust de de deniers and uh, and anti-Semites. And this is very damaging to the uh, Palestinian cause. Uh, which is a cause that uh, definitely uh, needs to be uh, uh, able to break uh, uh, not only Zionist uh, or pro-Israeli or whatever unconditionally, uh, unconditional pro-Israeli attitudes in the West, but even in Israel, uh, it, it should be able to detach from 
this uh, uh, right wing uh, Zionism and uh, massive, I mean, a significant uh, uh, fraction of, of the people, if ever there is uh, any, any peace uh, to be there. I mean, whatever kind of solutions one contemplates to the conflict, unless one believes in the military solution uh, and so, some uh, terrible uh, catastrophe in the region. Uh, whatever political solution one might imagine are solutions that go through uh, and, and necessitate a split, uh, a break in the Israeli society away from uh, the, the, the kind of, of uh, attitudes that have been increasingly developing uh, in the last uh, decades. Next question, please. Um, in, in the introduction of your book, um, you mentioned that Nakba in Arabic and Shoah in Hebrew uh, roughly translate into each other. And it's not necessarily that these two events are objectively comparable, but it's worth noting that both Nakba and Shoah, when translated into English, both mean more or less catastrophe and allude to sort of an equal level of significance in uh, respective cultural histories of Israelis slash Jews and Palestinians slash Arabs. Um, so we've spent a lot of time tonight talking about um, the place of the Holocaust narrative in the Arab-Israeli conflict and how it often has negativizing effects, the Nazification of Arabs and Nazification of the conflict on one side, and then um, the taking out of an anti-Semitic tone on the other. But knowing that there's a commonality between um, these two experiences, Shoah and Nakba, um, do you foresee some way that the narrative of the Holocaust can be involved in this conflict in a positivizing effect um, in order for the two sides to see each other eye to eye in a better, in a better way? and a um, more conducive way to discuss um, negotiations and peace. Thank you. Well, you know, basically, uh, I, I do not think that the, uh, the Holocaust uh, belongs to the state of Israel. Uh, the, I mean, the Holocaust is a defining uh, tragedy, in the, at least in 20th century uh, history. And, uh, and it's, uh, I mean, the lessons that one can draw from, from, from this uh, historical tragedy uh, are indeed universal lessons, as you can draw from any such forms of tragedies, of course, but uh, the, the, this was a particularly uh, important moment. And, and uh, this is the, the outcome of the, 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 the development of, uh, of, of racism, uh, anti-Semitism being one form of racism, xenophobia and the rest. And, and the, the, the most elementary lesson here is uh, the one of opposing any form of, uh, of uh, ethnic discrimination, of racism, uh, etc. And, uh, and in that sense, uh, the, uh, the behavior of the Israeli state is not uh, um, conforming to these forms of lessons of uh, uh, that one could draw from the Holocaust. Of course, you could draw other types of lessons if you want to look at the Holocaust in a uh, narrow ethnocentric uh, way and, uh, and therefore combine that with the Nazification of the enemy and then get into the, the kind of attitudes that have been pervasive in the Israeli polity over, over the last years. Yes, sir. Could you say a few words about attitudes towards the Holocaust that Arabs or more generally Muslims who are living in Germany today may have? I'm asking because a year ago in Germany I went to a presentation by a Holocaust survivor who speaks frequently to school groups and he was very discouraged about his efforts to have outreach to Arabs and Muslims living in Germany. They have a very, very closed minds. Yeah. Yes, indeed. And you, you had the, uh, even uh, on that uh, score, we can point to um, 
attempts done in Israel, for instance, to teach the Holocaust. And there, were, there has been some studies of some people, I even met uh, one of these persons recently in, in Britain, in Oxford. And one of the key findings that they had, uh, uh, which uh, goes against, for instance, those who think that in order to educate about the Holocaust, it's enough to translate into Arabic books about the Holocaust. I mean, that's important important to do, that's fine. But that won't be enough because they, they, they won't be read uh, beyond a small minority unless this connection, uh, the connection uh, between the Holocaust and the Nakba is established and understood. And that's why I said this is one of the uh, deficiencies on, on, on uh, which are common on, on the Arab side, not everybody, of course, but this inability to, to understand uh, what kind of connection there has been between the rise of Nazism, the arrival of the Nazis to power, the persecution of, the, of Jews and the expulsion of Jews from Germany up to the genocide of Jews by, by Nazi Germany uh, during the war, and the, uh, the implementation of the Zionist project uh, in, in Palestine. And uh, I mean, uh, any real knowledge of this history will comfort the, the, what was the initial and the most common attitude that you had uh, in the Arab world uh, at the beginning of the rise of Nazism, which was to reject, I mean, to define Nazism as uh, an abject, racist, imperial uh, uh, system, uh, but at the same time, to say because uh, the the, the uh, I mean to to uh, to uh, show empathy with the the, the, the plight of of, uh, of German Jews, but at the same time to say that this cannot be solved by at the expense of the Palestinians, at the expense of the Palestinians through the, through sending German Jews uh, to Palestine as was done through the agreement between the Zionist movement and Nazi Germany, the Havara Agreement, uh, signed uh, little after the, the coming of the Nazis to power and through which the immigration of German Jews was channeled to Palestine. That was the only destination to which they could uh, uh, take some of their belongings in the form of, uh, of German goods uh, exported. And uh, so the attitude was uh, that one. So, this connection has to be understood and well understood in order for people to be able to look at the Holocaust with empathy and not see the Holocaust as just uh, uh, the, the justification uh, used or instrumentalized by the, the State of Israel to uh, legitimize its actions. Next question, please. Uh, to what extent did uh, Nazi Germany encourage uh, Arab populations to be anti-Semitic and anti-Israel before the start of World War II because uh, Eichmann uh, visited uh, the Mufti of Jerusalem, I think, in 1936 or 1937 to encourage and promote uh, that Arab, uh, those Arab riots against Zionism and the British government. And he, uh, the, the Mufti was connected with the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt which was founded in the 1920s to uh, encourage uh, Islamofascism by, re by re uh, continuing the uh, Islamic um, Caliphate, which was lost uh, in Turkey at the end of World War I. Yeah, well, you are repeating the kind of propaganda discourse that I, I, I mentioned uh, during my talk. I mean, already this uh, idea of Islamofascism uh, I mean, what does it mean? It's uh, we are conflating two ca completely different categories: fascism as a actually very secular kind of uh, uh, ide political ideology and religious fundamentalism. And uh, would you say uh, Judeo-fascism about Jewish fundamentalism? Would you say uh, uh, Protestant fascism about Protestant fundamentalism, etc.? I mean, these are you have fundamentalism in all religions. And and this way of trying to, 
to uh, define the, the one in the Arab world as, uh, as fascist is just a product of what I, uh, I don't hesitate to call Islamophobia. This is, uh, you know, the kind of attitudes that developed, uh, especially after 9-11, but, but have been developing uh, for, for many years now uh, in, in, in Western country. This is this, uh, this discourse about, about Islam demonizing uh, Islam under such terms, uh, and you have uh, this whole literature which leads in this country to a crazy guy wanting to burn Korans or to two months' uh, TV and media attention over this Islamic cultural center close to ground zero. Uh, th th this is the, 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 the kind of attitude, and you, this is in itself, ultimately, the, the source of such discourses is a form of racism which is not uh, less serious than anti-Semitism. This is, again, a form of ethnic hatred and a form of, of racism. Okay. Um, thank you very much for your comments and your discussion. I have a question. It seems to me that over the past 10 years you really have had a heightening of tensions. And I would say really since the apparent failure of, of the Oslo Accords, the um, start of the Second Intifada and the election of Ariel Sharon, um, and it seems to me that it's come to one conclusion on both sides that the conflict is intractable, that there really is no hope on both sides for a resolution, a peaceful resolution of any sort. Um, so my question is, do you believe that this has been a gradual change over the past 10 years? If you agree with me, if this has been a gradual change over the past 10 years, or do you, can you, do you think you can point to any specific instances that have really heightened the tensions or heightened the disillusionment? No, uh, the, there has definitely been uh, a change o over the past uh, 30 years, actually, and I, I described it in my, my, I tried to describe it in my talk, and the, the key change in, is in Israel, the, the, the shift to the far right at the helm of the Israeli state, which, which, which leads to this position, uh, for instance, today, about the settlements, about all that, I mean, this, uh, the attitude of the, of the uh, Netanyahu government, and this is the, the main and major obstacle to peace. One cannot, in any uh, objective manner, say that you had the same at the, at the, uh, on the Arab side. On the contrary, on, on the contrary, on the Arab and Palestinian side, you have had a shift rather to milder and milder attitude towards Israel. I'm speaking of governments. Uh, what I describe as a, a expansion of expressions of anti-Semitic character, Holocaust denial, uh, at are the level of, uh, of, of uh, what you find in, uh, in segments of the public opinion, in, especially in, in, in those do dominating uh, forms of, of mass protest. But at the level of the government, there have been actually what could be described as concessions after concessions. And especially, I mean, if you take the Palestinians, it's even more, uh, I mean, uh, clearer than that. Uh, up to, I mean, what do you want more than the, the kind of attitude that uh, Mahmoud Abbas, uh, the head of Palestinian Authority, per personifies? He, he's seen by many people, many people, I mean, among the Palestinians as, uh, you know, a kind of, uh, uh, total capitulationist uh, character, and yet on the Israeli side you have a permanent, uh, uh, you know, uh, inter, I mean, uh, uh, escalation in, in, in the right-wing discourse and in the hawkish attitude, and that's the main impediment to peace in the Middle East. Uh, there's, I mean, absolutely no, uh, in my view, no, no possible uh, you know, discussion of, of this, this reality. I mean, this is among us. Just compare the attitudes on both sides. Thank you. Yeah. Well, this is going to have to be our last question. Um, uh, I'm shaking as I ask this question because I, I, I know what kind of can of worms I might be opening here. Um, and and it, it seems to me that, that in a way in which um, y you you rightly say, and I, I, th I think this is true, that many Israelis of the right bent um, overemphasize the role of the Grand Mufti and the Nazification of Arab populations. In a similar kind of way, I fear that um, on the Arab side, there's an overemphasis on the European component of the Israeli population. So I'd like to move from the period before 45 to the 10 years from 45 to 55. 
and again, you can hear my voice is shaking because this is a hard question, but if you look historically at the, the million, in the 1920s of, of the millions of, of uh, Orthodox Christians who were moved from Turkey to Greece and the number of um, Islam's Tur Turkish ethnic moved to Turkey and then you look at the number of Muslims moved from India to to Bangladesh and Pakistan after 1948 and the number of Hindus that were moved from those areas in, to India. Please explain to me how this is different. She said shaking. Yes. Well, uh, it is different in one way. In the way that this is not seen as for most of what you described, which are uh, ethnic uh, cleansing uh, or uh, forms of ethnic uh, separation, violent ones uh, bit, uh, among populations that were coexisting for centuries. Uh, the difference here is that uh, it is seen, uh, and it is, uh, the outcome of a colonial project. That's a key difference. That's, that's what I'm just that's oh, I'm, well. I, I'm yes. I mean, you. you I'm so, I'm no. You don't look at the no, you you can't. You can't. I mean, uh, the non-Europeans came after the creation of the state of Israel. Exactly. I'm you, talking yes. 45 to 55. Yes. They no 48 after 48 in the right. 50s. Right. The Iraqi Jews mm -hmm. and the rest came right. after uh, the the creation. But the creation, the fact of the creation of the Israeli state was very much European. I mean, European Jews, not uh, not Arab Jews. Certainly not. I'm they not they they. I'm, yes. not, I'm not disputing that the Zionist okay. project was a European project, but yes. I'm saying today, in yes. 2010, if you look at the, the actual component of yes. the Israeli population, who came from where, yeah. this, the numbers I've seen is that approximately 700,000 yes. people yes. came no. in that immediate post-state yeah. period from countries yes. that were Arab countries which is roughly equal to the number of Palestinians who yes. were forced out of Israel. It's well, a question. Uh, yes, in some of the instances, people were uh, uh, pushed out of their countries uh, to Israel, especially in the Iraqi case, where you, have, uh, you had the real spoliation and forced uh, what amounts to an expulsion of, of, uh, of, uh, of Iraqi Jews uh, under government of, of Nouri Saeed in the, in the 50s. Uh, but in other cases, like Yemen was under British uh, domination, they were brought by the Zionist movement. And not to mention the possible, you know, there are disputes about uh, the role of the Zionists even in Iraq. I mean, uh, bombing of synagogues and all that. You have a lot of, of controversies about that. So again here, it's not that simple, natural phenomenon uh, equivalent to every, every uh, that you, what you had everywhere as you were depicting. There are specificities to this conflict. Now, uh, again, uh, I mean, I, I stress, the, I speak, for instance, in the case of Iraqi Jews, of their, of their uh, expulsion, and of course this should be uh, very much condemned, and uh, uh, I mean, Jews, Arab Jews, Jews from Arab countries who have been victims of spoliations or whatever as a result uh, of the conflict uh, have rights, and these rights should, should be acknowledged. But uh, if we acknowledge these rights, we should, uh, first of all, try to uh, acknowledge the, 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 the initial rights of, of the, of the uh, Palestinian people. Now, this said, let, let me tell you one thing, and this I, I keep uh, giving this uh, important, I think, uh, comparison. Uh, you had, in 1948, an Arab-Israeli war between the Arab League of States and uh, the, the, the new Israeli state. And so on the face of it, that, that was an Arab-Jewish war. Uh, and you had, at that time in 48, uh, sizable, important uh, Jewish communities in several Arab countries. Never or nowhere you had in any Arab country what you had in this country, which is supposed to be the beacon of democracy, what was done to Japanese Americans. Internment camps. Have you seen that? Were there internment camps for Jews in the Arab world? No. So, I mean, you, you have also to acknowledge that. I mean, if you look at the real history, <laughs> the, the real outcome of that, is actually what is striking is not 
any uh, Arab collaboration with Nazism or, or whatsoever is the contrary. It's the fact that there were much fewer, uh, in relative terms and in absolute terms, mu much fewer uh, Nazis, ideological Nazis, in the Arab world than you had anywhere in Europe or the West or this country in the 30s and the, the war. So that's the, the, the reality, and that's the thi what has to be taken into consideration if we want to go beyond this, this, the, all these misrepresentations trying to essentialize and Nazify uh, the conflict and Nazify the Arabs, and that's the key point. And I think this is, uh, I mean, what I tried to do, and that was a way of combating all these demonizations that are very common, as I started by saying, in this conflict. Thank you, Professor Oshkar. Thank you, Professor Baskin. That's Thank the end you. of our program. The World Beyond the Headlines lecture series is a project of the University of Chicago Center for International Studies. Our nationally recognized programming is made possible with support from the Norman Waite Harris Memorial Fund. Download recordings of other events and learn more about the World Beyond the Headlines series at the Center for International Studies website, cis.uchicago.edu.